ladies and gentlemen, welcome to In the Bag. I'm Robbie C. How are you doing today, ABB? I am doing great. Had our first tags match today, played horribly, but we are filming In the Bag, and I'm excited. I'm excited for our guest today. Um, very special guest today. Yeah, very special guest, very unique guest, and really a unique bag that I was not expecting either. I just saw it right before we started, so... Uh, very cool, excited. I think it, it might help a lot of people. Again, this is kind of like a, not to spoil completely, it's like really a bare bones bag. So there's like a lot of potential. And maybe some of you are joining us and listening to us are kind of in the spot as well. This guest only has seven discs in his bag. Yeah, I, this is someone that I've had the the opportunity. I got to meet him through a connection of a friend to a friend and uh, and getting to meet him. Super excited, very nerve wracking because of what he does for a job and my personal background. So I was like, oh, man, this is crazy. Mm -hmm. uh, and then the first time that I played with him, I was like, why do you have this huge bag for the few amount of discs you have? Um, but one way that you're going to be able to see the bag is through our presenting sponsor, Disc RPM. Very grateful to the team at Disc RPM for having an in the bag community that everyone who comes on the show, you can see their bag. You get the chance to check it out. We're going to encourage our guests. We'll give you a tease. His name is Dylan, uh, a chance to hopefully he'll update and throw some pictures in there because he has some mm -hmm. really cool looking discs. But Brad, how many members are we at in our community right now? As of the recording of this, which is Thursday, we have 995. We will be doing a giveaway at 1,000, Robbie. And this actually, this giveaway was donated by a very kind gentleman. Yeah. So keeping the star power coming. Uh, he owns a little disc golf course that some people have heard of. A lot of people Maybe. haven't. It's called Maple Hill. Uh, Steve Dodge created a disc golf board game called Birdie. And when they implemented it or when they created it they made some modifications and made a new version called birdie pro well i had the chance to actually meet steve in person at the northeast disc golf expo and when we got the chance to do that uh we talked about birdie and i have played a ton of birdie myself and we were hyped about the game and he was like hey how about this what if we gave you a copy for you to give away on your podcast i was like wow we were we have a giveaway coming up absolutely perfect so mm -hmm. If you, once, once we hit a thousand, we will do a giveaway. We'll have the details on the next episode. If we get five more people to join between now and then we'll give the details on how to give that giveaway. But we want to thank Steve for a copy of birdie pro to give away. We want to thank mm -hmm. you, the thousand people that have joined our community. Uh, just so, so grateful for the people continuing to listen and support what we're doing here, Brad. Yeah. Extremely grateful. Thank you all for supporting us. And Hey, Let's not waste any more time. Let's jump in to this interview and let's get Dylan in. Come on. Welcome into the show, the star pitcher of the Chicago White Sox, Dylan Cease. How are you doing today, sir? I'm doing great. Thank you for having me. We Dylan, appreciate you being on. You, you have such a unique connection to disc golf that I feel like yep. lots of people don't have. And even in the title, I was like, how do I want to introduce this man? Like, do I want to introduce him for like what lots of people know him for? Or is there a world that you like, you'd rather be more known as the owner of these two great properties? You know what I'm saying? Like what's, mm -hmm. what's your vibe right now? Uh, well, probably more known for baseball because that means I've had a great career and that means all the spoils there. and all the, everything that comes along with it. That's fair. Is That's there. fair. And I can take that and leverage it in disc golf, but uh, I, I definitely want to be known as uh, as a premium course guy for sure, and uh, you know try to build that up. Absolutely. So you've got two properties that you own, uh, and yep. three years ago you didn't own either of them. Uh, and uh, two years ago, I don't think I owned either of them. I was going to say I don't know the cactus when we were there. Two years ago, I was like, I was trying to remember if Cactus had officially been purchased yet or not. Was, uh, was that two years? Ended ended twenty two, right? I think so. Yeah, yeah. yeah. Just uh, you just may have just gotten wilderness, it. wilderness raw land at that point, huh? Yeah, just, I mean the Cactus just standing strong. So tell us yeah. about Cactus Rock first. Yeah, so Cactus was uh, kind of my initial baby. Uh, it all started. I was playing at the Title Town Classic with my twin brother. And uh, I had met some of his buddies who are super passionate about disc golf and uh, they, they do landscaping as their main job. And I just kind of mentioned to him, 
I was in a very ambitious mood at the time. I was like, I want to expand. I want to do something cool with disc golf. I think disc golf's underrated, all this stuff. And uh, I talked to him. I said, I'd, I'd like to buy some reasonably priced, beautiful land and see if we can't make a premier disc golf course and, you know, like really have something, you know, a brand that we're proud of and uh, just just do something epic and, you know, kind of push the envelope. And uh, they were like, yeah, that's we that's kind of like our goal, too. We'd love to do that. We're, you know, up in Maine. They have all these pay to play courses we used to play all the time. We love the idea. And uh, we just shot each other uh, like I think it was Zillow or whatever, whatever land thing, land watch Zillow. Mm -hmm. We just kept sending each other land that would come up and he would go drive to it and be like, uh, you know, this had this issue, this had that issue. And then uh, eventually we we circled back because I think we had sent it to each other way earlier. And then he circled back to it. And he's like, hey, I'm going to go check this out. He goes and he checks it out. He's like, man, there's this pond, there's water features, ton of elevation. And then there's this big, big cactus and a big rock and, you know, all these cool features. And uh, I, I could tell he was convinced that this was the land. So. I ended up going out to it and, uh, it was, it was very raw, but you could see, you could see the beauty and the potential of the land. It was, um, you know, just very, very scenic, uh, definitely very uh, wilderness vibes, which I liked. I, I kind of like nature disc golf. I think it's, it's really peaceful. And then, uh, you know, being around big, big, beautiful trees and rocks and streams and creeks, it's just, it's pleasant, you know? So, uh, and at that time, I really didn't know if these guys could actually do it. All I knew is they were extremely confident. <laughs> and uh, so I, I, I let them sell me and I was like, all right, so how's this thing actually going to work? So we had to go through the process of creating the LLCs and all the agreements and getting the insurance and this and that. And then somehow, I don't know how we actually made it happen. You know, I mean, we've graveled, we've graveled the road all the way up from the kind of the main road down where it was just dirt. And I know you had trouble with that when you came and visited. So yeah, we got it, uh, you know, graded and all that. So, you know, no cars have any issues getting down to it now. Built a big parking lot. I don't know how many acres it is, but it's it's big. And then uh, they've done an unbelievable job of of going out there pretty much every day in their in their free time and just carving out fairways and taking their time and really figuring out where water runs off and and, uh, you know, just carving out land it's it's i can't believe it's like 10 times cooler than i ever even thought it was going to be so uh when we get this thing open which i think i think in april we might do a little like uh fundraising tournament for alabama disc golf uh the university of alabama disc golf club That'd be i'm sick. not 100 percent sure um there's a lot of things that have to go into that but the course is uh the course is crazy cool and we definitely have to have to get you out to it yeah i i cannot wait uh, and the with his hands crew, uh, from just even the pictures you're seeing, like the fact that you've got grass growing, like yeah, in the woods, always yeah. looks sick to me. Mm -hmm. Instead yeah. of just like oh, bare leaves on the ground and everything like that. So, uh, you've had you had a friend come out and design it, a friend that people yep. may know, uh, and yep. it's actually going to be covered on the Disc Golf Network on their on their like extra coverage and all that. Uh, mm -hmm. so who? Who designed it and how'd you meet him? Yeah, so Paul McBeth, we met him through social media, you know. Uh, so I, I think I met him really through, uh, so Discraft obviously is located in Michigan and uh, I'm, I'm in Michigan playing the Tigers all the time. So uh, it just happened that one time I was able to go and, and see the factory. It's only like 30 minutes away from where we stay when we're in Michigan and uh, connected with Bob and uh, Paul and all those guys and just developed a relationship with them. And I'd been bugging Paul forever, like, hey, let's make a course. Let's do something. And I think they I think they wanted to financially protect me, and they didn't want me to put my money into something that they didn't know if it was going to succeed or not. But after I had my, my good season in 22 and then made it further in my career, they're like, all right, if you want to take a risk on this, we'll, we'll help you. <laughs> so, uh, yeah, Paul came out, and, you know, we designed it in, like, two days. He's He was on a tight schedule between, you know, just he's got a lot going on and now he's got a kid. He's got even more going on. So he gave us two days of his time, which was fantastic. And then I think he's come back two more times um, to kind of continue to reshape and give his, uh, you know, 
his ideas of what needs to be tweaked and whatnot. Mm-hmm. Man. Yeah. I just watching, watching someone with experience, like kind of roll through and just seeing lines and things like that, where you're like, Oh yeah, I can make a course in my backyard yeah. and it would be epic or whatever. But then when you actually see someone do it, it's unreal. Like Brad, you have a course on your property. Mm-hmm. What, like, what vision did it was it like you saw a hole and then you kind of spider off from there or what was even what you were doing in your course design work brad yeah i think my i was just thinking about that as dylan was talking you know i think for me it was i knew what i wanted the first hole to be and i knew i were what i wanted the last hole to be and it was like making it all be cohesive together mm-hmm. and I, I also wanted to be like i didn't want like okay everything's like a 300 foot hyzer or something like that. I wanted to make sure I had like, I had to throw a turnover. I had to throw a forehand. I had to throw like a really straight gap kind of shot. I had to like really make, and I would, I tried to make it not like catered to me also. Like I wanted it to be hard for me. I wanted to make me better and I want it to be interesting for people. Um, so that, that's interesting. And you know, I, I like that. I'm not good enough. I don't have the experience, obviously like someone like Paul, but it was fun. I do have the luxury of having two courses designed by Paul here locally. So I do get to see like maybe a, a vision or like look into his brain a little bit as what he's looking to for these courses. And it is, it's a whole nother skill. It's one yeah. I don't necessarily possess, but you know, like you said, Robbie, seeing the lines and like, you know, someone like Paul obviously knows the very fine details between like, what does a turnover shot look like versus a forehand, like right hand mm-hmm. shot look like? And what are we looking for? And how do I tweak this basket like a foot to make this a whole different hole? So I think that it's it's pretty incredible. So I was just looking at pictures, Dylan, of the course. Uh, that cactus is iconic. So that it's very, yeah, very beautiful property. Yeah, I don't think people realize how big that thing is. I mean, I, I sit next to it and it's pretty much my height. And then the boulder is like eight, nine, ten feet tall. Yeah, it's it uh, it's it's definitely a big feature. And yeah, I think when it comes to the course designing, it's like you're half architecture, uh, ar- yeah, architect and then half engineer. So mm-hmm. when they were out there carving out these holes, I had I couldn't see it. It's I guess it's not my skill set. So I was just sitting here like I mean, I trusted Paul because, you know, it's Paul and he had a vision and he was excited about it. But for me, I was like being in the middle of the woods, I couldn't see the shape of anything. And I was like, uh, it, it's the fact that what they've been able to do out there is just honestly wild to me. There's, there's nothing those guys, the, the Williams brothers can't do. If we need a hole on the side of a mountain, they will literally carve into the mountain and they will make it happen. Mm-hmm. It's uh it's been, it's been a very cool process. Yeah. And I think it was interesting. You said they're landscapers by trade. I, I love yeah. that because not only can they, they know a lot about like moving earth and like all that, but they also can make it look nice, which I think is exactly. always pleasing. Like, one of my favorite things about New London, it's like, it is very hard course, but it's, it's also like pretty beautiful. I mean, it's a, like a good looking course too. And I think that's really cool how they're like kind of adding that uh, into their design. So that's great. I yep. think it's awesome. And then also you have, a, you own another course, which is going to yep. be featured very soon. So tell yeah. us a little bit about that. Yeah, it's uh, so basically a week after Paul got, got finished designing uh, cactus rock for the first time he calls me he goes hey would uh would you want to own another course and i was like uh yeah what what do we got and he goes well basically the the best course my favorite course and you know the most well-known course in florida uh the land is about to go up for sale and it's going to be turned into you know residential or or they're going to build houses on it and uh it's super iconic i think we could turn it into a you know, like a, a pay to play course and a, a, a really great course. And, uh, after he told me that I was like, yeah, uh, let's do this. So, uh, we, we, my big thing was that I, I wanted to rebrand it and give it a new name and kind of give it a new identity. And, uh, my first idea with it was Vesuvius. Mm. And, uh, they gave me a hard time and said, for one, there's no way you know how to spell that. For two, you don't even know what that is. <laughs> I said, "All right, that's fair. What do you, what do we think?" And he goes, well, "Why don't we name it Olympus?" So, uh, yeah, we we named it Olympus because we wanted to kind of play on the you know the mountainy canyon kind of feel with it and uh, give a little bit of that mythology kind of something you know something that hopefully is going to be kind of iconic to mm-hmm. to feed off each other. So, 
I was down there this off season. Actually, I was able to, to fly down for a couple of days and see, uh, we, we put a couple new holes in there and, and, uh, just walking around the property. I, I'd, I'd almost forgotten how cool it was. And then it kind of refired me up like, man, this thing is so sick. And especially the fact that it's in Florida that has nothing but flat land that to, for there to be this valley mountainous, really, it's really beautiful land too. It's like, mm-hmm. Everything about it, the, the live oak trees that have that Spanish moss coming down on them, um, just it is such a cool course, and uh, it, it's going to be awesome to see it on on YouTube in a couple of weeks. Yeah, yeah, I'm definitely looking forward to that. I, I'm looking forward to the redesign too. I, th- I thought it was a great course to begin with, and it's it's always that sneaky coverage that I'll watch at the beginning of the year that I just completely, you know, I'm like, oh, this is a great course. I, I always forget about it, but I think you know, like the rebrand and everything, and just the your name and Paul's name attached to it now is going to bring it a lot of uh, extra notoriety. So I'm looking forward to it for sure. Yeah. My yep, understanding. We had, uh, oh, sorry. Go ahead, keep going. No, you got it, Doc. Uh, I was going to say, yeah, we got 500 lifetime memberships. Uh, we've sold, you know, X amount. So there's not 500 left. So we got to keep that in mind if you're <laughs> mm-hmm. out there uh, trying to get something cool, trying to help out the course. So uh, all of your support out there is definitely uh, much appreciated. We've got a lot of big ideas for the course and, uh, Unfortunately, things in life cost money. So That's true. the more that we can create a quality product and get, uh, get be given some thank you coupons, that would be awesome. Yeah. yeah. I Have you ever gotten to play Toboggan up in uh, yeah. Michigan? Oh, okay. yeah. So my, I've not played uh, Olympus, but my what I've always imagined Olympus to be is when you're playing Toboggan, it has to be called toboggan because that way you just, it like hits you in the face that, you know, I'm playing on a sledding like track course area, right? Mm -hmm. Like you're seeing the ropes, you're seeing all that. To me, my understanding of Olympus is that it's similar vibes, but it's like actually pretty because of everything around it. Yeah. It's, um, how would I describe it compared to Topogon? It, it's definitely similar in terms of the elevation changes. There's a ton of elevation change. Um, yeah, I would say, I, I would say the the sheer beauty of it uh, to me, Topogon is very green, and that's kind of the only thing you see where you've got a lot of rock faces and and uh, you know a little bit of water on on uh, Olympus as well. And um, to me, it's just. A really scenic it's almost like if it wasn't a disc golf course you could turn it into like some sort of botanical garden if you wanted to mm. you know really do that um mm. and i love that when i'm out disc golfing because me i'm i'm half frustrated with my performance when i'm playing so i need something to calm me down so being somewhere being out in nature and something that's beautiful uh really makes the pain of being horrible at disc golf a lot more bearable i I think if you play that. disc golf and you don't get frustrated with your performance, you either just don't care or in a way better life state than 90% of the disc golf population <laughs> or, yep. uh, yeah, you've just not been playing long enough would be my, yep. my third alternative. Yep. So, um, no, I love it. And I think we, we didn't mention, uh, cactus is in Tuscaloosa, Alabama yep. for everyone. Just yep. want to make sure that we clarify that. Um, so these two courses, I mean, it's what, like, nine hours between them 10 hours no i think like i think it's shorter i want to say it's seven okay sick yeah, yeah I, I was just trying to wrong, base it off of my like how long does it take me to get to orlando mm-hmm. and i know that it's not in orlando it's in brooksville but yeah uh yeah okay so yeah so very convenient uh our dream uh even in talking to dylan about it is that folks are gonna like play this florida part and on their way to other courses it's like oh you know what I'm going to let stretch my legs a little bit. Why don't I play cactus? Uh, and then yep. it just builds that beauty. So definitely yep. if you're in the Southeast, we, we have some good courses down here for sure, but championship level, hard, hard. Like when I go play new London, it opens my eyes to, Oh man, we are on a Like it's another level. Mm-hmm. I think that cactus is going to be a really cool addition. Uh, so and I can't wait for cactus merch, like, uh, see you at the rock, uh, on the like mm-hmm. shoulder. And then it's just the cactus chilling on the rock in the back. Like it's going to be awesome. So, mm-hmm. oh yeah. Endless, endless possibilities. Come on. But speaking of endless possibilities, Dylan, 
you're not just a course designer you're or a course owner even design you know i'll give you designer you know you've had some input on the holes uh yeah uh, hole 15 at cactus i i kind of we had these big creek rock, rock features that weren't getting used i'm like what this is like the most beautiful thing on the land we got to incorporate this so hole 15 is my hole at cactus other than that they got to design and do whatever they wanted i just i just fund it hey that's fine. That counts. That's, somebody's like you said, unfortunately things cost money and somebody somebody's got to do, do it. it. Uh, yep. and so course owner, course designer, world famous pitcher doing your thing, you know, uh, but you also play disc golf. I do. So when did you find disc golf? How long ago did you find disc golf? So my twin brother introduced it to me probably around 2017. I didn't like it at first. I didn't get into it. I thought it was silly. And then uh, I would come home and he'd be studying for school and uh, he'd have Joe Manzano. I'm like, what are we watching right now? I'll get, I remember getting frustrated with him. And he's like, no, no, it's sick. You got to give it a chance. And uh, I, I went out with him one time. We, I, I think I walked a course with him when he played it. And then I gave it a chance and I got hooked. I don't know how it happened. And then COVID came around and, you know, basically all you could do was do something outside or sit in your house. So we went and played disc golf probably four or five days a week for I don't know how long trying out new courses and, and just, you know, playing against each other. And, uh, I just got hooked. It's, uh, you know, it's funny. It, it's even, even being not a super skilled player, but you know, just every once in a while getting that perfect flight or hitting that angle or making that putt, just, uh, it's just a lot of fun. And, uh, so I wanted to, uh, yeah, I definitely want to do some some big things with it and just keep trying to take it to the next level. So for me, performance wise and skill wise, it's probably never going to be the way I did that. But teaming up with Paul and and doing courses and other cool things is uh, is super satisfying. Yeah, I I like that that moment, the shot that brings you back. Right, it's that I threw in from mm-hmm. seventy five feet. I got that full flex out of that force and it cleared four hundred. Like. I hit my line. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, like I'm trying to remember in North landing that whole, that like turnover, I think it's like seven or eight. Uh, like you pure one down to the basket there and it's like, yeah, Yeah. I know what I'm doing today. Uh, heck yeah. So, uh, to get to know your game, uh, cause I think a unique caveat is obviously people love people who are baseball fans love the fact that our season is so long. (laughs) people who are not baseball fans are like, I can't stand the fact that baseball season is so long. And I don't even think they understand from a player's perspective, how much longer the season even is for y'all when you add in spring training and all that. So like you're leaving in a couple weeks, right? I'm leaving on Sunday. Yeah. Yeah. So we caught it at the perfect time here, Brad, Uh, or else we would have caught him in the Arizona. Arizona. Uh, Yeah. So yeah, I've got I've got a no media policy there, so I wouldn't have made it happen. There we go. So we we snuck in right at the right time. We're the uh, last disc golf uh, for, interview. For Robbie, getting. Robbie, if I'm starting and you say, "Hey, man, I need you to hop on," I'll be at the field and I will go find a room and we'll get on. We'll talk a little disc golf and I'll go dominate, dude. Yeah, of course. I love of course. That. I I'm here for it. No no hitter for sure coming this year. I believe. Uh, I'm I'm in for it. Um, You'll be the first guy to text when that happens. Okay. I look, I, I'll hold you to it. I'll hold you to it. So we, uh, we want to let players get to know you a little bit for your game, uh, and how you play. Yeah. So we have a couple of questions that we ask, like to get to know folks, yeah. um, and is, understanding is this where we do the, uh, whisper ASMR right here. Yeah. 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 We should get real close. And we're just, our eyes are flips are great. I do throw a lot of buzzes. <laughs> It's fantastic. So uh, we have a couple of questions we ask. And once again, I, I open with that, like people don't want to realize that six week period you have, because that's about the only six weeks that you get to like actually adjust anything in your game. And yep. then you just kind of kind of ride it whenever you get the chance for the rest yep. of the year. So yep. I get golf, worse every year. Yeah. It's like a perpetual cycle of like, oh, I'm so hyped and I'm improving. And as soon as you start to see that improvement and we're off to Arizona. <laughs> <Yep>. <laughs> You, you um, got to see some some of my good rounds this year, though, so I'm happy about that. I did arguable dominance. Arguable being the key word here, but we did argue till three in the morning about it. But I I, I must say that we were what we what what percentage we came up we were like what fourteen percent more dominant than you guys. 
or was it eight percent? It was some, I, mean, it was I something. think it. I think it was eight. I'm pretty sure it was like. Yeah. We mathematically figured it out. It was about eight percent. Okay. Yep. 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 Uh, well, Josh is going to get real excited here in a second. Listen to this. So uh, <laughs> and then he's going to be bringing up the in the comments. He'll be bringing up the round of you and him playing each other at uh, North Atlantic. <laughs> so uh, that was anyway. great. Very windy. Very yeah, 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 yeah. So uh, we we asked players how far if we put a basket in a field. Uh, and we were like, all right, Dylan, how far can you consistently like throw to reach that basket? Normally we say forehand and backhand, but you don't throw forehands because got to protect yeah. the arm. So how far would you say you can reach consistently for a, like if we just put it in an open field? I think I think for the most part, I'm always going to be in the threes. Um, I do feel like there's some times where I let it eat and it feels like it's about 280 and I'm sitting there like, man, I just don't get this. But sometimes I, I sync it up and I feel like I'm in the upper threes. So I, I would say if you gave me an order between 280 and 350, that's probably what what you can rely on. I think 350 is actually a little bit on the high end. It's probably more like 330. I haven't figured out my power stroke with disc golf. You know, I've tried a bunch of different stuff. I know I don't know how to get my legs into it and all that. And it's like, I don't really have the... Uh, I don't really have the ability to change my form, unfortunately, because it would take a lot of hours and time. And, you know, just for me, I, I have to be more casual with it. But, uh, yeah, I think I can get it into the uh, into the threes. And, uh, you know, if I hit my line at 280, I'm just as happy as if I had thrown it 400 feet. Yeah. See, I, and I'll give you more credit for that as the guy who's played with you and watches a lot of disc golfers. I think 350 is pretty pretty spot on for you like 350 yeah. and i think if you're mushing one like i once again think of north landing and like there were a couple 400 something foot par threes or par fours and yeah. y'all were in jump putt range so i think like yeah. 380 is probably like 350 to 380 is what i would give you personally uh yeah in an open field we're not talking like yeah pipe uh, shot in the woods or yeah we're not yeah. talking sequoia pure pure openness so uh if we put you on the putting green and we were like all right on the putting green you've got to make 10 putts from 15 feet 10 okay. putts from 25 feet and 10 putts from 40 feet how many do you think you're making at each station so that really depends on the day because that uh <laughs> when we played doubles at sequoia and i was automatic i would have been 10 for 10 at 15 i mean there's no doubt about it two days later when i played josh for our <laughs> You know, to, to test our dominance, dominance match. I would have been two out of ten. So the inconsistency is just, I mean, it is hard to overcome. And, and uh, but let's just say I'm really feeling it that day. Fifteen feet. I think there's no reason why I couldn't go seven for ten, something like that. What was the next one? Twenty. Uh yeah, twenty five. Twenty five. Twenty five. Mm -hmm. yeah. Oof. Twenty five. We're gonna go five or six out of 10. And then what was the next one? 40, 40. Yeah. Ooh. Test two out of 10, three out of 10. That's fair. I, I would agree with it. I, your putt. I completely agree that having watched you played, there are days where your putts on and it's just like, all right, sick. It's and I feel like it doesn't matter. Yeah. It's yeah. wild. If you hit one or two early in the round, watch That's out. the key. That's yeah. The key. You miss that and first one or I two. Like a, yeah, sometimes it's I feel like a baby giraffe out there like that's weird. My body just did this weird thing. I aimed right there and I yanked it to the right. And then you get in your head. You're like, what's my adjustment? All right, I'm going to do this. And then doesn't happen, unfortunately. And I'd be curious from a like professional pitching standpoint, right? Like you got to treat all the batters like you can't be you can't be scared of a batter, right? Like, no, Altuve sitting in the box like, all right, sick. Still got to take him. Uh, still got to attack him. So from a putting confidence standpoint, you know, miss an early putt or two, and it's like, okay, I got to deal with that the rest of the round. Is there a similar vibe? Like, how do you approach, let's say, your first, uh, you're starting the game, you, you're you getting towards the end of the season, and it's like, all right, cool. Like, we need these for sure. Yep. Um, and your first batter or two, like, gets a sneaky hit on you or something like that. Yep. How do you approach that versus – Oh, I just, I mean, I was, I caught him looking for the first inning. All three of them just got him. 
I think uh, I think it just comes down to focus. And if you're if you're so focused on what you're doing, your emotions and all that don't really have time to kind of cloud what you're doing. So it's just especially with baseball, it's like anything can happen at any time. You can strike the first two guys out and the next guys can go back to back to back home runs. Even if you make good pitches, you know, it's it's very much a game that. It's sort of limited to what you can control. Fortunately, as a pitcher, I'm like the casino where I'm, you know, statistically, I'm you come and gamble. I'm taking your money. But every once in a while, you know, it's, uh, good things don't happen. So it's just uh, a little bit of it's like having mental strength and resilience and not allowing, you know, the situation to kind of get you make you unstable and dictate how you're feeling and all that. Uh, and, and it's just battling in the moment, being focused, battling and, and, uh, you know, not really having any quit no matter what it's, it's like taking pride in, all right, I might've just given up seven runs in the first, but now I'm going to go and try to get to five innings. So I don't have to tax the bullpen or, you know, just mm. little things like that, where it's, it's, it's taking pride in, in going out there and battling, even if you just got, you know, got kicked in the butt. Yeah. Yeah. Uh- Obviously, never experienced that. Never will. Uh, but it's not fun. Uh, I gotta but, say, it's not <laughs> ideal. I could, I could only imagine. But I, I love that idea of like taking pride in it, believing in yourself. Like, I mean, that's I watched. I had a doubles partner last night um, playing some glow golf. Who first couple putts just didn't go his way, uh, and he was like, "Oh, I'm short on it. I'm short on it. Like, I can't get it up. Like, I can't get it there." And I was like, "Dude, your putts looking good. Just like." a little more finger pop and those are all in uh all day and sure enough by like halfway through all of a sudden it was like okay so i just gave him a couple like 10 footers hit those get the confidence going again so pride in it i think that's i think that is definitely something a lot of people don't take pride in their putting and it Mm -hmm. shows the moment they get the putting green (laughs) i go I, i i roll up to a course and i go to hole one that's about my uh my putting extent it's funny too the the difference between that kind of ha- that feel trusting that feel and being relaxed as opposed to thinking mechanical and going okay I need to really get into my legs and I need to do this and that and then you get stiff and mm. there's no flow to it where I've noticed what, with my best putting days it's like I just put my eye in the chain and it comes out of my hand nice and I can literally just do it and the days where it's not there it's I'm I'm a helpless I might as well be six years old and you need to bring me my Baba and I, I, you know, that's about, that's about all we got. Yeah. Yeah. I, I come from like all growing up, I did competitive archery and traveled all around and doing that. And what, and I felt better, better putting the last maybe week and a half because I was finally like, okay, archery was a lot. Obviously there's a lot of mechanical things you have to do, but there's also a lot of like feel and like, all mm-hmm. right, this is a, the anchor points in the right spot. And I, I, you know, there's a lot of feel to it. And I'm like, maybe I should take that approach to putting. And just like, all right, what feels good? Okay, I know where my anchor point is and I know what the release point needs to feel like. And I have to say today, even though I didn't play my best round at tags, it was because of bad tee shots, not because of putting. I actually saved some score because of my putting today. But even on the practice putting green, to your point, Dylan, I was like, okay, I I hit the, the cage on the first couple, but I'm like, that felt really good coming out. So it was like a very positive, like, okay, I was very close. It feels good. It looked good. Let's just keep doing the reps now, and we'll get them in the in the chains. So I think yeah, make yeah. a very good point. Yeah, I think I think the most ideal state to be in when it comes to to anything accuracy based is basically being focused on your targeting and trusting your body, and that's very hard to do. You know, it's I think uh, uh, for me, anyways, I'm I. I like thinking in terms of mechanics and trying to kind of control my body. But, you know, I know I've always, when my eyes are just on the target and and I'm focused and I'm trusting, whether it's baseball, disc golf, whatever, that's, that's why I'm at my best. Yeah, for sure. Well, Dylan, you have a very unique bag uh, and we'll have it on the screen here. Uh, It is for the, when I looked at the size of the bag you carry uh, of like a Paul, uh, I think it's an A series grip bag. I was like, oh, man, this is going to be loaded out. Here we go. And then you opened the bag and all the discs all were the basically like <laughs> laying on the mm-hmm. like they were laying flat. Like you don't, there's not even enough discs in there to like prop them up. Uh, yeah, that's what, happens, that's what happens when you go out and you throw them in the water and, you, you know. <laughs> 
uh, I have wi- I've witnessed a lot of second shots just disappear. Uh, yeah. Even in the in the rounds we've got to play together, it's like I'm a risk taker too. It's a problem, you know. I'm like, all right, we'll go for it again. Bang, uh, <laughs> Bob. I'm gonna need another shipment. Sorry, man. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> so uh, you have seven discs in your bag, which is very unique. And these seven discs, if we're putting them on a scale, it's like there is a chasm sitting between them uh and i remember even when we played last time we stepped up to a hole it was like 300 feet and you were like oh yeah i'm throwing my force on like a flex line flat through and i remember just being like do do you not just want to throw a fairway driver here like that that would make sense and then we looked at the bag and realized oh you you don't have any uh okay cool 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 so uh, we want to talk through these seven discs real fast uh because we won't hold you up too much longer we want to respect your time but uh, we want to talk through these seven discs and just kind of talk about your function and how you use them. Uh, and then Brad, Brad is a longtime disc craft guy, has gotten away from it a little bit, but his heritage inside of disc golf is disc craft discs. Mm-hmm. So hopefully answer talking through the discs, he'll be able to land on like, hey, here are a fair way or two that I think might actually help you a good bit. Mm-hmm. Um, so you got Lunas, you putt with Lunas. Yep. Do you have a throwing Luna in the bag as well? Yep, yep, throwing Lunas. Um, I would say I use the zone for my approach almost every time, but it's good to have a Luna for those understable. Or I'm not the best at hyzer flips. Uh, I haven't mastered that angle, so I know they would be great for that as well. I personally pretty much just use them exclusively when I really need to make something take a hard right. Mm-hmm. Okay, yeah, and that makes sense because I think people look at the flight numbers of a Luna if you never thrown one and you're like, Oh, three Oh three, that's the same. Like that's the same as the zone. It's going to be flying real, real. Hard. Nope. Mm-hmm. Mm-hmm. Understable. Yeah, for sure. So you also have, you have a buzz in your bag and I think you have one or two buzzes, right? Like you've got a flippy yeah, one. Got and a tray one. Buzzes. Yeah. They're, they're, uh, I feel like they all pretty much either fly straight or slightly understable, which I like cause I mean, it's more straight. I wouldn't say understable is the, the way to describe it. Um, they definitely don't have that hard finish left like a Malta. Uh, but yeah, I've, I've, I've enjoyed the buzz. Uh, it's the disc I didn't, wasn't super familiar with before I kind of got on the disc craft train. And, uh, it's definitely one of my workhorses. And then the Malta, what situations there's the Malta versus the buzz for you? Yeah, just if it's uh, something that I really need to finish left, hit that, hit sort of the, uh, I don't know if overstable gaps the right word to describe it. Um, something where if I know if I throw it straight and just let the disc do the work, it's going to get there as opposed to having to, you know, do angle manipulation and all that. It's, uh, I, I use the Malta a, a good amount, actually. Yeah. I just I, realized I'm, I'm, I'm missing two discs I didn't put in the bag as well, the, the Raptor and the Zone. So I have to include those as well. Yeah, okay. and that's, that's that is that'll help on the extreme sides as well. Because I mean, you can't be a disc crap thrower and not have a zone in your bag. That is, yeah, absolutely, or two, absolutely, you know? yeah, or or several. If you get like a jawbreaker, you know, a little straight action, and then the Z. So many options there with the zone. So uh, we're gonna jump over the fairways and jump into the distance drivers real fast, and then we'll come yeah. back to the Raptor and the Heat. Uh, so you've got a Force, a Hades and a nuke in your bag. Yep. What situations are you using those in? Yeah, so my force, I have a real beat-in one that almost flies more straight now, uh, and that one that one gets used probably the most. Um, and that'll be, I guess, anything that I feel like I, I need to get it to go straight for a little bit before it takes that left. Um, so my two a 280-foot hole, if it's wide open, I'll probably take my force out, aim right, and just let it do its work. Um, the Hades understable, anything, anything that I need to go to the right, I'm just throwing the Hades straight or even maybe on a little bit of hyzer and let it do its work. Um, it's definitely the force and the Hades are, are two of my used, most used discs for sure. And then the, the, what was the other one? The nuke, the nuke. Mm-hmm. Yeah. Uh, I, I, I don't use the nuke a whole lot. I think for me, because I don't have that top tier arm speed. So I don't even feel like I really get, mm what I need out of it. I'll use it sometimes, but, um, you know what? I realize I'm missing it. Do you remember that Zeus I have in there? The one, the first run Zeus with the, uh, Macbeth stamp. Yeah. That thing is my, 
my best distance disc for some reason. It, it almost has a little bit of turn before it starts kicking left. Um, that one, I, I if I if I have to get power and I really it can do any shape shot, any uh, shape as well. So um, yeah, they they all have a place in the bag for sure. Um, but the uh, the Zeus and the Force are probably the most two uh, used out of those. Yeah, the Zeus is one of those molds that I think a lot of people look at as very like a force alternative Mm -hmm. but it it is a lot more to me it's almost like for the innova people you have destroyers and wraiths and like a wraith is an easier to an easier to throw destroyer Mm -hmm. that is how i would almost describe the force zeus combo of like most every force you're ever going to throw unless you just beat it in like you have dylan is going to always have that stability at the end. Mm-hmm. Whereas Wraiths will sometimes, if you even find the right Wraith, they can flip up out of the, like off the shelf. And I think Zeus's are quite similar. Um, yeah, yeah. I started bagging a Zeus in the, the ESP jawbreaker Zeus. Mm-hmm. And for whatever reason, and Dylan, I don't have the arm speed to throw a Zeus really either, but for whatever reason, it feels really good in my hand. I have bigger hands, so it feels really good in my hand. And for I can throw it so far, and I don't know what it is. It's not like I can throw any twelve speed in there and throw it far. It's just that Zeus. I mean, you know, I've I've been measuring it because I'm like, do I do I really throw it farther, or is it just you know perceived? But I mean, I'm consistently throwing it over three fifty like every time, and that's I don't have a disc like that currently. But yeah. so I don't I don't know what it is. It's it, to your to your point, Rob. Nice. It's probably just easier to throw. Yeah. Then you you build that you know that nice relationship with that disc, and it becomes your. Uh, your daily every day. And you know, that's, that's one of the great things about disc golf. Mm-hmm. Yeah. It, it doesn't have to make sense. I think that's the, that's the message here. I just, yep. it can make sense for you. And I think that's what I feel with it. Um, so re- real quick with your, we, we kind of like skipped over this and highlighted it, but Dylan, you're, you're throwing zero forehands because you have to protect Correct. your arm. So yep. how does that like affect your disc selection? Are you, are you okay? Let's just say you have a left to right hole, right? And you're you're off. You're coming off the tee. You're obviously going to try to throw like your Hades or your Heat. Mm-hmm. If it's something that's like a, a clearly forehand hole, are you? Is your strategy like okay? I'm just going to get to the middle of the fairway and take my next shot, or are you just like you said you you like the risks? Or are you just like I'm going to bomb this Heat over and just try to get as far as I can, right? My strategy should probably be to just play for par, and you know. <laughs> 200 straight, 200 straight. Yeah. What I normally end up doing is going, okay, what's the 3% shot that I can do here? If I perfectly throw this Hades on Anheuser angle and uh, get, get it down there, it's going to be really epic. And then what I end up doing is yanking it, throwing it into a tree and then just scrambling for my double bogey. So I, I have learned as I'm, as I'm getting farther into my disc golf career that, uh, there's no shame in, in playing for par sometimes, especially if you're if you're having if you're doing more of a competitive round and not just for fun. Uh, but I, I wish I could sit here and say I play the smart routes, but I, I usually just go for it. Uh, yeah, doubles golf is that's why I think we just all have more fun when we're with you playing doubles golf because it's like you know what I have no problem throwing that 200 foot <laughs> shot and just putting it in the middle of the fairway, and then you do you just. Go do your thing. Uh, like, send it. Here, here's what I'll say. Like, the 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 pro about having a very, like, a small bag or, like, not a lot of molds in your bag is, like, you know what the Hades and Heat are going to do. You know what you're relying mm-hmm. on. You don't have three or four discs that are sort of like that. So you're like, okay, this is maybe a Heat shot. This is maybe a Meteor shot. This is, you know, you're not, like, doing that. So you're like, hey, my heat's my super understable disc, and I'm I know it's going to go right for me. Let's yep. just go for it. I think there's and there's I'll, a beauty to that. I'll have days where I'm for whatever reason I'm locked in with one, and then I start throwing on on holes that I shouldn't, and start using it. You know, the shape shots that normally I would be using the other disc. So it's mm-hmm. uh you know this this golf's a good game like that. You know, sometimes you're just getting a feel and you're getting a rhythm with something, and you got to ride it. Yep, I, I feel I'm, that. So, so that fairway us, drivers, yeah, yeah, that brings us to the the noticeable gap on this chart here in front of us, Dylan. So, before we like recommend anything to you, is there a reason yeah. you haven't? I mean, you have the Raptor, you have the Heat, right? Yep. So, is there a reason that you're like, ah, I'm not going to mess with these fairway drivers? I'm either going distance drivers or I'm going down to my mid ranges. Uh, you know, 
I would say that's probably a, a mix of being a novice, you know, like uh, I've, I've had under is undertaker would be considered. Yeah. Fairway. That would right? be fairway, yeah. So, yeah. yeah I would consider uh, that. You know, I've had undertakers, but I've lost it's it. A lot of it too is like, if I have a couple of discs and I lose them, then it's like, all right, let's go upstairs and see what we got. I'm filling the bag with that. So, but Bob, the, the guys at Discraft do a great job of sending me all kinds of cool stuff. So, um, you know, I think it comes down to not knowing what I'm not knowing what I'm doing a little bit, you know, mm-hmm. just, uh, but, uh, yeah, I, I would love, uh, I would love any advice on, on fairways that you guys got for me. What I, what I love, I love fairway drivers. First of all, I was at a point where I pretty much took all the distance drivers out of my bag and I was like focused on fairways because, and correct me if I'm wrong, Robbie, but for me, like getting that arm speed match and having the disc fly as as close to intended as possible, there's a beauty to that. There's also some confidence, like for whatever reason, when I grab a distance driver, I'm like, I've got to crank this thing. I've got to just pump it as hard as I can. With a fairway, I feel like I have a little more finesse with it. And I think that that's kind of the beauty of that. Um, so I think there, there's a couple options you could de- go here. I think what you re- you have the heat that's all the way on the understable side. You have the Raptor that's all the way on the super overstable side. You really need a nice disc that can give you almost what you're kind of describing as your force shot, which is that like pretty straight. And then you have some overstability. I think that would be probably the area I would recommend Robbie for this. Yeah. Um, and I, I like seven speeds personally. So that's kind of like where like my head automatically goes. And I think you kind of have a couple options. I mean, there's a, there's a, a big one here. Um, your buddy, Paul has a disc called the Athena, which I think would probably be a great disc for you to work into that slot. You know, I, I actually think Robbie had me bag one of those. Didn't you? Were you, I think we got one in yeah, the bag. You had one. Uh, has it has it been thrown? TBD. Uh, but mm-hmm. uh, it hasn't because I don't think I've played since you guys left. Wow. But wow. it's it's in the bag. Yeah. Hey, that 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 matters. But what I love about the Athena is it does have that. Like again, for it's funny calling your arm a novice arm, knowing what your profession is. But disc is. golf novice arm. I think the Athena gives you like a. You can still get that disc to fly pretty straight because it's a seven speed. You can get it up to speed. It will still have like that pushing straight and we'll start hyzering out like the last 80, like 20% of the flight, which I think is a really number one, a really common shot, I think. And a really like uh, malleable shot. Like you can really like shape it to what you need. And I think Robbie gave me a little peek. He said, you might like, you kind of like a little bit of Anheuser on your release. And like, it'll also, I, I tend to do it even on, I, I think it's because you know how they, they say that you're supposed to shape your shot with your body as opposed to your arm. Mm-hmm. so i'm a big i'm like neutral when i release it so i think that neutral is actually me kind of going you know yeah. i don't have i don't i don't have enough of that bend at the at the waist and the hips to do that hyzer angle so even when i feel like i'm throwing it straight i'm so like uh i don't know erect Upright. i guess you yeah. could say yeah, uh, yeah that uh, it actually comes out of my hand with a li- just a slight amount of turn and sometimes it works to my advantage and it's super cool and i'm like yeah, I meant to do that. And then sometimes mm-hmm. it makes me go into the tree or into the water. Mm-hmm. Uh, to your point as well, it is what I've realized is it's very newbie to be using these distance drivers on. Let's just say we're at Sequoia and it's a hole that's 320, but there's it's wooded and it's tight. Me taking my force out, the odds that I pure that and don't hit one of those trees is almost zero. So it would it, in theory, it would be a lot smarter to just take my buzz that I, I can throw 280 or whatever and like give myself even a shot, you know, it's, yeah. uh, that would definitely be, uh, a, the next level of my, my disc golf, uh, growth for mm-hmm. sure. Yeah. yeah. And I think what's cool about, again, the Athena, like it'll still handle that. If you do release it on some Anheuser, it's not going to flip over on you. It's still going to handle that. Um, just hold so, straight more than anything pretty much. Yeah. It, it may give you a little flex, like a, a small one. It's not like super overstable, but it does have stability to it. Yeah. So I think that would probably be the place I would recommend, but the, I had two kind of close recommendations. One being the stalker. I just think the stalker is mm-hmm. very underrated and yeah. I think it, it gives you that lost it. Unfortunately, I need to get another one. Yeah. yeah. And I, w- again, I think I, I am going to recommend this, Robbie, it's going to surprise you, but the, the passion is a great, just like neutral. 
easy if you get the right run easy flip up straight flies pretty far disc i just it just scares me being like a natural like anheuser release person like the passion scares me for you i don't want you to get like it flipping on you and turning Mm. Because that's yeah. not really the gap we're looking for at this point. I don't is it think. is it uh is it less understable than the Luna? That that's an approach disc, right? The Passion. It's a fairway. It's, no, it's a it's fairway. It's, oh. Eight speed. Yeah. Mm-hmm. Oh, okay. I don't know why I had that. You're thinking mm-hmm. the Fierce. Yeah, yeah, that's what you're thinking. Yeah. Also, yeah. H Pierce disc. Yeah. yeah, and the reason the re I'm I'm known for throwing the Passion in a trash can. Like I just don't. It's a great disc. I don't like the hand feel of it personally. That's the only reason. I wish I did because it's it was it's an ideal disc for me, but I can't get over the hand feel. But mm. I think even for you, like Athena Stalker is probably where I would maybe stay again because I think when we get into the disc like the Passion, even the Sting, Robbie, we're Dude, now like yeah. hitting these smaller gaps in between the two discs versus like a broad, really good one. And I mean, now that I think about the Stalker, the Stalker may even be a better choice than the Athena. Yeah, because I think if you have that Athena in your bag as an alternative, I would shift. So, like, if the beauty is you're looking at the website, Dylan, it like has this chart, right? So the heat is on one side of the chart, and the Raptor is on the dead opposite side of the chart. Yeah, Raptor so, is not. That thing's yeah. not used very often for me. That is a straight meat hook. Mm-hmm. Yeah, even if you try to flex it on some Annie, you've got to hit it so hard. Because yeah. it's yeah. just popping out immediately going left. So yeah. for the Athena, let, let me ask you this. Yeah, far away. How much how much more overstable is the tilt than the uh Raptor? Is that thing I mean they gotta be are they close or no. not at all? Uh, so tilt is animal. just wild. The mm. tilt, if I throw a raptor as someone whose my dominant angle is extreme amounts of hyzer. Like if I don't think about my hyzer, I'm throwing on like twenty three to twenty four degrees of hyzer automatically. Um, so like, but I can rip an Annie when I need to, if I rip a Raptor on Annie, I can get it to like fly straight and flex out a little bit because I can also get the nose down on it pretty easily, which helps. Cause if you throw a nose up on Annie, that's why it's also fighting out so fast. Um, but like if I can rip it, but the tilt, if I throw the tilt on like steep Anheuser, it is still going to fight out and barely get 250. Yeah. Wow. It's a that, it's a uh, very interesting disc. I don't know why this reminded me of it, but I mean, we won't we don't have to go into details, but I just got to thank Robbie for giving me one of the hardest laughs I've ever had on a disc golf course at <laughs> North Landing. Can you think of the moment that I'm thinking of right now, oh, Robbie? I, that cicada's long gone, dude. Uh, uh, oh, no. Oh, no. Can we can we tell this story or oh for Absolutely. sure for sure yeah uh, all right so he he you borrowed the disc right that wasn't your disc right correct it was not my disc we did it back me and Dakota did a bag swap while Josh and Dylan are playing each other in a dominance match and uh, we're we're basically it's almost like on a dam I don't think that's what it was it's it's just higher land we're right down to the right you've got the pond. Our shot is down a hill to the left. I mean, yeah. it is the water is not in play. You have to almost turn the opposite way and throw it to get in the water. Mm-hmm. He borrows he borrows his disc. Bang! Right into the middle of the pond. It oh no! Was, it was one <laughs> of the worst grip so- locks I've ever had. And like my hand is all the way past me, and I can still see that the disc is in my hand. And I'm like, oh no and it just <laughs> rips out and there's a basket that sits on like a buoy in the right middle, in the of, middle the of the water pond. like they're trolling you it was perfect yeah you would have thought i was trying to ace it uh like it was That's amazing just way off to the right which to be fair was justified because literally the first hole that we do this bag swap i grab a super overstable disc out of dakota's bag and i throw it because there's that same lake is on the right Yep. And I like go to throw one and I was like, I fade out super early and I was like, well, rule number one of a bag swap. Just don't lose anyone else's discs. Ha 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 ha. And Dakota steps up, grabs a Raider out of my bag. That was a flippy Raider and just <laughs> burns it straight oh, into the water. No. So, <laughs> so oh, I threw that cicada I, in there and I was like, and we were like, oh, I, I, I guess we're we had that. I wish we had that on video, man. Even telling the story about it doesn't do it justice. Just, and we've all been there. Like, I've yeah. done worse. We've all done that. So it's not like, you know, that was just so, to see that thing come out of your hand and immediately go right when the hole is, I mean, the complete opposite direction. It was tough. That's just comedy gold, man. That it was, was hilarious. Tough. Amazing. Yeah. 
Dude, I the as you talk about the stalker, Brad, I think the stalker, how you describe your buzz, Dylan, mm-hmm. I think a Z stalker is that. Like you can throw it on some like, especially early on, it's gonna season in and like be a little more on the understable side. But to me, the stalker is just a longer buzz. Like okay. which could be really nice on those shots where you're talking about like 320. I just need to go straight. That seven speed is going to be a lot less volatile when it hits a tree mm-hmm. than the yeah, 12 speed true. forces. That is yeah. a big issue. You you clip that tree just a little bit and it's 115 feet off into the woods. Then you got to go spend eight minutes looking for it. And mm-hmm. it's not good. It's yeah, not the stalker good. has the stalker has a little stability. Like it has some sneaky stability to it yeah. at the very end. Yeah. Which and we good. have, we have a good amount of the Z ones. If you're listening, mm-hmm. uh, that's every time I go up to visit, I'm always like, I don't know why more people aren't buying these Z stalkers because these things are amazing. Um, mm-hmm. That's so, the truth. Yeah, I think I think we get a Z stalker in there for you, Dylan, to test it out uh, and pair it alongside that Athena you have in your back when you get yeah. to go play, and it'll be it'll be a fun addition. Just think longer buzz. I'll tell you what. What are you uh, What are you doing tomorrow, Friday? What am I doing tomorrow? Uh, I got, yeah. I, I, if you, if we're going to the rock, I can bring his, I can bring a stalker for you to try. I'm, I'm thinking about going and driving up tonight, spending the night and spending the day at the rock. If uh, you're, you're trying to go out and see the, uh, I've been told there's a lot of really good, really good updates that are going to be exciting. So, okay. Uh, I'm going to see if I made it happen. You, you want to join if I end up doing that? If you end up doing it, let me know. Let me know. All I'm right. down. All right. Bank and I can just deliver a stalker in person, and then I'll just get yeah, I'll just get it from Brad later. It'll be perfect. We're just like Amazon next day delivery is what next we're going day delivery for game on. Uh, foundation Can't disc stalker. No. <laughs> I love it. Well, Dylan, dude, thanks so much for coming on. Uh, yeah, we great. appreciate Thank your time you. this morning and uh, wishing you the best of luck this season. Uh, and once again, people can follow you, uh, Dylan C eighty four on socials. I think it's Dylan C seven on Instagram. Yeah, I, I need to change it to eighty four. I'm I'm not good with technology, so I don't know how to do it. I'm sure it's easy. Uh, yeah, Dylan C seven, uh, and then I in my bio you'll see it says co owner of uh, Cactus Rock DG and Olympus DG. Uh, so we're we're trying to obviously get the social media hype for all those courses and you know build some brands. So do you want to support us? Uh, Come out and play them. We don't have merch or anything that yet. We need to get that going. Uh, but yeah, lifetime memberships, greens fees, however you want to support would be awesome. But uh, yeah, appreciate you guys having me. And uh, hopefully I'll be seeing you tomorrow, Robbie. Hopefully. Hopefully. Yes, sir. And there we have it, ladies and gentlemen. Another guest, legendary guest, probably one of our most famous guests thus far. Uh, That's true. And man, I love that guy. I love spending time with him, hanging out. Uh Hey, no. our next our next level up. We need to get Burt Kreischer on in the bag. That's that's I, the next step up. I think that's I'm I'm here for it. I'm here for it. Uh, also, our fa- it's going to be our fastest delivery of a disc, possibly ever. Uh, yeah, until we get that drone delivery system, you know. Yeah, <laughs> just put it <laughs> It'll be a you know those little toys like when we were a kid. They had, like little disc shooters that were like battery powered that yeah. shot the little foam discs. It's going to be like that, but on a drone and actual disc being shot at you. Yeah, you can. You're hearing that <laughs> noise in your head at the G. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Tell me you're a '90s kid without telling me you're a '90s kid. Am I right? Oh man, I love it. Well, Brad, great episode. Uh, I once again, I think that if you hear the connections he has, to be like, oh, he only has that many discs in his bag. Shocking at times, but. Yeah. He slings them. There's He's there's a well. beauty to it though. I, like I said in the episode, there is a there is a beauty to it that I respect. Absolutely, absolutely. Well, y'all, uh, we are so grateful for you listening. But if you want to be like Dylan and you don't have a bag filled out, where can they go? What's new in the warehouse, Brad? Yeah. So we are. This is Thursday when we're recording this. We're gearing up for our foundation five year anniversary live stream tonight. So if you didn't and you're listening to this on Friday. If you didn't get a chance to tune in, I'm sorry because you're going to miss out on a lot of cool drops and a lot of cool stuff. So we're prepping for that. But we still have managed to get a ton of like Discraft restock up, a ton of Innova restock. Um, if, you, if you're if you a disc dyer, there's a ton of like Paul Macbeth and Paige Pierce line, white all white ESP that's bottom stamped. Mm-hmm. So perfect for your dyes if you're a, a disc dyer out there or you just like 
white discs. I mean, that's a great one to do. Um, we also have um, merch. So I'm wearing the Tour Life. Uh, I believe it's called Get Groovy shirt. Has some for your visual our vi visual audience out there. Um, right now, it looks like I'm looking at the scoreboard on Silas's desk. Grip Locked is definitely ahead of Tour Life. You know, Ooh. I did show we did show our support of Grip Locked last week. We're going to show our Tour Life support. So make sure you check out. The Grip Lock, the Intour Life merch, help them out in that little bit of battle they're going on. It's been pretty fun to watch. But we don't have ours in yet. We'll have ours in hopefully in a little a little more than a week. But Come we on. have all new in the bag merch. Silas, if you're hearing this, pop up some in the bag merch. Pop, 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 like that. Pop, 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 pop. Um, we got t-shirts. We got hoodies. We have hats. We have coffee mugs, which I'm excited about. So... As always, we appreciate your support. If you can support us by buying some merch, that would be amazing. So uh, check out the In the Bag collection on foundationdisc.com. So excited to have our merch in-house on, on the website. So check that out. Uh, again, if you didn't check out the Foundation live stream, we do have something else exciting happening on Friday when you're listening to this. We have a brand new text deal alert system. What yeah. this is, is you sign up with it you just, and we will, we're will we going to spend out send out special deals every week. Um not to spoil what happened on the live stream, but we had like $10 vultures, which was awesome. Dang. So um, I believe Friday, if you're listening to this, if you signed up, you're going to get a special deal on some used mystery boxes. So make sure you check that out. Um, again, it's free to sign up. And what's cool is you like, you'll get a, you'll get a text and it'll be like, Hey, we have used mystery boxes on sale. Our text deal only people get the, the first access. And then you can just text back. Yes, I want one or I want three or I want five. And then it places the order on, uh, order automatically for you. We get it and we ship it out to you. It's as simple as that. That's awesome. So, um, I think that's it's a very cool thing Hunter's been working on. I'm very excited to put it out there. So make sure you sign up for that. And again, we're almost to a thousand members at nine ninety five at the time of this podcast for our in the back yeah. community. Love having you guys in there. Love seeing all the cool discs that everyone's been putting in. Thank you for your support there. And give away at a thousand. We're going to give away a Birdie Pro uh, board game. So. Thanks for uh, everything you guys do. Check out all the, the new merch. Check out um, Disc RPM in the bag community. And above, every, above everything else, if you got a good disc, make sure you keep it in the bag. We'll see you all next week. See you next week.